Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, sir. Welcome to the April 10, 2020 Board of Commissioner Special Meeting. Please silence cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices. Agendas are located at the back of the chambers. If you'd like to speak on any item, we do have a speaker request form. Uh, please grab one in the back of the bookcase there, and you could speak on any item today if you're um, in the public. And then Holly Hennies will take those speaker request forms, and that's Miss Holly at the left of the dais. And next, we'll have a moment of silent reflection, and then the Pledge of Allegiance, led by uh, Kevin Carley. Thank you. First, we'll have the review and approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Roskinex, second by DeSanto. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. We got to do roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Oh, forgot. DeSanto? Aye. Drews? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Roskinex? Aye. Hadcock? Aye. Thank you, Chair. Motion carries. Madam Chair. Mr. Just Kirsten. a suggestion. You're really going to have to be close to those microphones for me to hear you. So, what how's is this? this? Super. So, you guys pull your mics up. Hello. Here. Can you hear everybody now? Can you hear me, yep. Gary? Santo? Yep, I can. Okay. So, item five is COVID 19 update. Director Dustin Willett. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. Dustin Willett. Uh, Director of Emergency Management for Rapid City and Pennington County. Um, so, uh, you know, we continue to effort our our uh, reports and everything else that we're, we're doing in the EOC. This morning is our weekly uh, uh, senior leader brief. Um, that went all that went out ten minutes ago. Uh, so everybody should have that in their their inbox. Um, it'll capture trends uh, and numbers over the the previous week, uh, and then anything of note that is still pertinent to, to uh, your situational awareness uh, in, in regards to supporting uh, the decisions that you're asked to make. So um, just briefly, there's uh, we're still working really, really hard on, uh, and there's a big long name for it, but um, basically a, a medical diversion shelter for sick homeless. That's, that's taking a majority of our time right now. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts to that, but um, we continue to, to work on that um, pretty much all day, every day, uh, to try to effort a solution uh, in addition to, to the other things that we're doing. Um, did get a uh, bit of, of good information from uh, CISA, which used to be, uh, you know, it's the, the counterpart to FEMA under DHS that looks at uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure and, and um, uh, private infra uh, private business, some of that kind of stuff. And uh, they looked pretty hard over the last two months at supply chain. Now, granted, this is nationwide, not necessarily Pennington County specific, but uh, nationwide when they looked at, at supply chain, specifically at uh, like paper products, cleaning products, um, uh, and then the other thing they looked at, I should have written it down before I came. Anyway, so some of the, the, the concerns we have on supply chain, they looked at pretty hard over the last two months, uh, and the conclusion was um, there's not a supply problem. There's, a, it, like we all have maybe assumed, but they finally put numbers behind. There's not necessarily a decrease in supply. It's just an extreme demand. So whatever is causing that extreme demand, whatever psychology or buying patterns are behind that, uh, it's not that there's less available. It's just that people are buying more. And so we all kind of thought that or made some assumptions along those lines, but there's actually some data now that, that supports that, that, that position. So um, as people start buying less, those products should become more available. We've uh, been sourcing different, uh, more and more medical PPE is, is becoming available. Oh, you bet, is becoming available through some different suppliers. Uh, so 
again, not to paint a rosy picture, it's a, it's a, it's a significant situation all across the country, but again, as South Dakota is starting to, to see more cases, uh, there's the potential for other places in the, in the country to start their, their downward trend. Uh, and if you think about that in the same breath of thinking about all these manufacturers that are spinning up their production, uh, we could find ourselves in a situation where people are making a, a lot of medical PPE and a lot of medical PPE could potentially be in the market um, by the time we, we could potentially really need it. So um, can't bank on that, can't guarantee that, but it's certainly uh, something to, to, to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, is there anything specific uh, that I could answer? Any Madam questions? Chair. Commissioner Roskinen. Dustin, I really like the fact that we have low numbers in Pennington County, but I've also heard that uh, the tests that we do here take a long time to get results back and uh, and that we don't do that many tests, and that's why we've got little numbers. Uh, can, can you uh, expand on that, any? So the te most of the tests, again, there's not one way of doing tests. Every every doctor in town, every every person that that uh, runs tests is not doing it exactly the same way. So Monument is is our largest uh, healthcare provider in our community. Their tests, all of Monument's tests are being sent to Mayo right now. Uh, and I think the turnaround on that is somewhere between uh, anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. So one, one to three days uh, for the turnaround on those tests to Mayo. Um, other providers are still sending tests into the state lab sometimes, and certainly there are tests going to, to uh, private labs uh, outside of the state uh, as well. So there's no one testing or, or system or repository for all that. It's, it's all different. It's all piecemeal. And the challenging thing uh, uh, with that question is we don't, the, the information of how many tests have been run specific to Pennington County, uh, if those numbers exist somewhere, they're, they're not being shared. So uh, we don't have a hard number of this, you know, X number of tests have happened in Pennington County. All we have been told, and, and uh, there's no reason necessarily to doubt the information, all we have been told is that the, the testing is equitable across the state. So if you look at that total number from the Department of Health, what are we up to, 6,000 tests? I, I, I don't Somewhere necessarily look at that number hard, but about 6,000 tests that, that, that have been run, and, and what the health department has said is that those tests are spread um, equitably across the state. So it's not that East River is testing more than West River. Uh, if you basically look at population, the, the testing is pretty much the same based on population across the state, and that's all we've gotten from the Department of Health. Uh, last question would be, where is the temporary shelter being put up at? Um, so the one that we are working on is Rushmore Hall. So we're not, uh, again, uh, we're hoping to have that. There's still some, some significant logistical pieces to, to work out on that, but the, the, the place that we are working on trying to stand one up is Rushmore Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. Um, basically, to the same uh, thought process with the homeless, even though we get a shelter built for the homeless, they don't. They can't be forced to go there. Is that correct? They. We can ask them to go there, but we may have. So one of the things quite we're a working few that on. Won't. Yep. Yep. So compliance is a is a tough thing, uh, and and that is one of the pieces we're working through on on how do we handle compliance versus non-compliance. Uh, what are the legal mandates? And obviously, we're not going to be. You know, it's, it's not our intent to handcuff people to beds or lock doors or, I mean, it's, it, that just can't be what it is. So uh, one of the common themes through this is uh, we can help those who allow us to help them. Uh, so that means that there is always going to be a segment of that population that we can't effectively help um, because they won't let us. And so our, our, just like medical triage, our intent is to do the most good we can for the most people in the community with the resources that we have. And uh, that means that there are some that, that, uh, that won't avail themselves of what we're trying to do and, and uh, we'll, we'll concentrate on doing the best we can for the most that we can. And Dustin, I understand that EM is uh, attempting anyway to 
put some educational material out there for the homeless so that they're not sharing drinks and sharing cigarettes and sharing things that could pass this between one another. Yep. Yep. That's certainly part of our uh, uh, messaging. Um, we, we tend to amplify a lot of official messages, and that's one specifically that that uh, uh, the commission asked we take a look at, and we, we certainly um, designed and, and, and distributed some materials uh, that, that had specifically that message. Very good. Thank you, Dustin. So what about the testing and the, if you think any of the homeless population have symptoms, can you then quarantine them in the Rushmore Hall? Uh, so again, quarantine is a, a word that has a lot of connotations to it. We right. can't force them. Well, there are some mechanisms in law that would allow that, not at, at our authority level, um, but through the state. The state has not indicated that, that, one, they're willing to leverage those laws, and two, logistically, we're not set up to force people to stay. Uh, that's not, that's the, right now, that's not a logistical um, uh, option for what we're trying to do there. So if someone tests positive that's homeless, we just let them walk around? In some cases, that might be the case. Mm. Wow. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but we, we don't know how that looks yet. I want to chime in, too. You bet. Sure. Madam Chair, if I may, Kevin Tone, Pandy County Sheriff. Uh, we, our Sheriff Association has been having this discussion on a statewide basis. And earlier this week, there was a case in eastern South Dakota where the Department of Health did intervene, and there's a process where you can get a warrant for somebody if they don't comply. Now, the problem is it's a, it's a Class 1 misdemeanor. So it gives you some teeth, but how that works in the system, and I'll let the state attorney, you know, address that. But I mean, if if our homeless population, maybe there's a way where, I mean, if the judge doesn't set a bond, we can use that as a leverage to, you know, keep them in that facility as opposed to the jail. So there's just a lot of tricks and traps, and we're working through some of it. But we're trying to figure out a way to leverage that so we can keep somebody from walking around that is either symptomatic or test positive, but it's going to be a challenge, no question. So. Heard my name. <laughs> <laughs> name. Madam Chair, Mark Vargo, Bend County State's Attorney. The Sheriff's absolutely right. Once we have some kind of criminal charge, at least with the cooperation of our uh, judges, we can release them with a condition that they abide by certain conditions. And if those conditions are being in a particular spot where they can be more effectively quarantined, then if they leave that spot, they'd be subject to rearrest. So there are some mechanisms, but from our standpoint, they don't really kick in until we have that first criminal charge, which might require the state action in uh, some cases. Okay. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I may, just uh, one other alternative we've offered to the other sheriffs, and we use this routinely, is electronic monitoring. So this particular case, East River, the person wasn't homeless, they were just non-compliant. So in those cases, you could use electronic monitoring to also augment what you're trying to do in terms of monitoring the compliance of that individual. So I think you might see that being used as a tool as well. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. Well, Sheriff, thank you for your, your guys' input. and and. Dustin for this because I think this is on the minds of uh, a lot of the people in our community and and it's good to know that there's things to looking at to, to help the homeless and and trying to incentivize them and help in a play for them to stay and we're gonna have problems with them I mean uh, when you're dealing with mental illness and chronic uh, alcoholism and those type of things uh, you know, their self-awareness and protections aren't as high as, as normal people when they're in those conditions. So I think uh, I think you guys are on the right step and, and hopefully we can find some ways. It's gonna be live and learn. Who You're gonna know who, you're, who, who the trouble people are you already know already. So, I mean, we can find ways to, to be able to get to that point to house them if needed and so forth. I think we I think working together we can come close as evidenced by the the, the conversation this is dynamic we're, we're figuring out new pieces every day the one thing we don't want to do is not do anything because we're still trying to figure out all of the details so um, uh, it would be reasonable to expect that we get something up and running doing the best we can with what we have and then that operation can certainly tweak and change 
as as the situation evolves, as different pieces come into play, as we figure out how to do different things. So uh, it's not like whatever we come up with immediately is set in stone and that's the way it's going to operate for the duration. Uh, so yes, being flexible, uh, being adaptable and, and leveraging the tools that we can leverage to best serve the community is what we're all about. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Ross Connick. Have we uh, considered doing anything with the lacrosse street facility that's currently sitting empty? Uh, certainly been in discussion. Uh, uh, that was one of the facilities that, that we've looked at. Uh, right now, uh, the, the, there are alternate care sites uh, across the community that have been um, assessed by the Army Corps of Engineers by a, a local team that specializes in, in, in evaluating alternative care sites. Uh, and for a number of reasons, uh, with the other sites that we've had available, um, we, we are keeping the La Crosse Street facility in our back pocket, but it's not one of the primary ones that we're looking at right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Does anybody in the audience have any questions today for uh, Dustin? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Items from Human Resource John Morrell on proposed remote work policy. Today, um, on we're going to have and, and discuss at the end of this meeting about having a work session next Friday and then having a commission meeting at like, the work session would be at nine and then the um, board meeting would be at one. And we're gonna bring forth instead of voting today on the, um, let's see, the furloughs, the necessary county functions, meaning exempt, non-exempt, meaning um, they're calling them emergency responders, healthcare providers, they're not using exempt, non-essential, essential words. Um, and this today, I think there needs to be more discussion on these three items um, so the board understands um, the point of view from other departments and John's, mm -hmm. and then Gary has information as well. So these will be um, not areas that will be taking motions today, we'll just uh, have discussion. So John, if you wanna start with proposed remote work policy. Back. Good morning, commissioners. John Morrill, Cunningham County Human Resources. So the remote work policy uh, actually that is being made available at this time because of the situation that we're in, uh, but this would be a policy that would be uh, applicable at any other time. We've been talking about this for a year or so. Anyway, developing some type of a remote work policy. Um, so this actually brings some structure to what that would look like. It gives all the information as to what the policy would actually entail. It outlines eligibility, process, equipment, um, security, safety, uh, all those types of things, as well as has a form that the department and the employee would complete together then to actually determine what that remote work agreement would necessarily have to be. So by that, I mean this. Remote work doesn't have to be a full-time setting. It can be something that's done a partial day setting. It can be what it allows for is a non-traditional work schedule. So a flex schedule, if you will, of some type for the employee as well as for the department. That flexibility not only helps in situations like we have today, but it helps in a broader manner because if you actually have that, it's, a, it's something that job applicants seek when they're looking for employment. So while we're talking about it under the COVID-19 situation, it's actually broader and has a, a much more purposeful use than just our current situation. This would be something, again, while we're putting it in place now, or that's the goal, uh, it would be something that could be retained and or changed as needed to be more broadly used uh, throughout the, the county uh, moving forward. So the information you have there today outlines what the process looks like. It specifically speaks to some of those pieces that need to be reviewed. Again, what's the process? What's the, the purpose? Um, eligibility, that it's not every person would necessarily um, be eligible to use the work from home or the telework piece. Uh, and then also the tax and legal implications, who provides what types of equipment, how much is provided by the county, what's provided by the employee, uh, as well as safety, and then how they would actually record their time. Um, so with that, I'll stand for questions. Just one question. Didn't we approve a telecommunication policy? No, so Madam Chair, we've... This replaced it? 
we haven't actually approved. We've discussed it at a few meetings, but we haven't had any kind of an approval process for that. Um, the change to remote work from telecommuting yeah. was based upon some of the job titles we have in the county. Okay. We actually have telecommunicators that work in our dispatch center. That was somewhat confusing as we looked at a telecommuting policy. Okay. It didn't necessarily apply to them in that same sense. So remote work is the, just a different def definition of the policy. Okay, that's that's kind of why, John, I'm not trying to delay what yeah. you're doing, but so we make sure we get the terminology we talked to, and you guys have been having, you, bet. you and Holly have been having department head meetings, and we've had lots of discussions. So we're making sure before we make any policies mm -hmm. that it works for um, our department. So um, that's why we're kind of um, looking, and you're seeing changes um, probably every couple of days sometimes, every week, uh, because of... COVID-19 and, and some of the policies that we haven't set forth right. at this time. So we're not trying to confuse people in the departments. We're trying to figure out what's the best solution for everyone in our department. So um, Gary, did you had some in information you wanted to share today? Yes, and uh, let me just point out that I'm having a very difficult time of hearing. I think it probably has something to do with all the microphones that are on at the same time there. Uh, in fact, the only thing I heard John say is uh, that's all I have. I'm open for questions. So uh, <laughs> not exactly sure what uh, what John had to say, but I will. Uh, I I have given uh, hard copies to uh, each of the commissioners. I hope you have them. Uh, in addition to John, I did reach out to our employment hotline, which is provided through our liability carrier, the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance. Lisa Marceau is contracted to work on employee issues for the members of the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance. She is affiliated with a law firm in Sioux Falls and her area of expertise for numerous years has been employment issues. And I asked if she had worked on or developed a policy for telecommuting. I wanted to make sure we had language that was supported by our liability carrier but was also providing what I believe is the necessary balance between county government as the employer and the employee. Uh, with the hard copies for your review, uh, she did provide me with one addition this morning on domestic care that uh, also should be uh, considered as part of this telecommuting agreement. Uh, I've added that as 1A on my hard copy document. Um, I don't think, and I, and I think I heard the chair say this, that this isn't something that needs to be adopted today. Uh, I think we've got, uh, we need to rework and, and put it on our next uh, meeting agenda uh, for uh, further consideration. You know, I do believe that employees are doing us a service by telecommunicating. I want them to know we appreciate their willingness uh, to continue performing their duties during this time. Uh, policies are always <coughs> subject to change, and if we discover areas that need to be adjusted, we can do that as time moves forward. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to present what I believe is a very understandable document that points out responsibilities of each party without too extensive of detail. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions in regard to the document I provided you. So, Gary, could you read the do domestic care what that means so some of the departments kind of know what you're thinking on that. Yeah, the domestic care, if, if I heard what you said, uh, Madam Chair, I think you asked me if I'd read that. Yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, it's basically one paragraph long, just entitled domestic care. Uh, the wording on that, it says, the employee agrees that family care demands shall not compete with the work hours established between the employee and the supervisor, except in the case of an emergency. Remote work will not be a substitute for child care, elder care, or other dependent care. Similarly, pets and other distractions may not impede the employee's ability to effectively perform job duties. Thank you. Commission, do we have any questions? Madam Chair. Commissioner Ross. John, this process, would this be strictly voluntary or would it be mandatory in some cases? So and could it, could it eventually be long term after the virus is gone? Could we say, hey, we like this and it works and and uh, we can do this on a full time basis in some circumstances? Madam Chair, 
Commissioner. Or yes, Commissioner, Commissioner yeah. yes. So yeah. there's, a, there's a number of benefits to this process. First, again, it outlines what the structure should be. It outlines the responsibilities of both parties. It is actually seen as an advantage, and it's not something that's available to all employees. So again, you have to take into consideration um, their performance. You have to take into consideration their understanding of what the job is. You also have some additional responsibilities of the departments or offices to also remain in contact with those people on a regular basis. Um, so it's an advantage. It's not something necessarily that is forced upon anyone. Uh, at the point we do that, it changes the, the arrangement. This is done right now to allow them to still be available for work and also to help us aid them as far as the social distancing uh, that keeps them employed, and provides benefits and service for the county as well. Um, so as far as the other part of the question, if I understood, could this be used moving, yes, long term. This process is one that we've been working on or talking about for an extended period. Um, the fact that this has kind of kick-started us in getting that on paper um, is one of the benefits, I guess, of the current environment. Um, but it, it's seen as an advantage. It's not seen as a right by the employees. Not everybody will qualify for telework, um, nor should they, based upon the types of duties that they have uh, or their level of work performance as you look at that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner LeCray. Mr. Drews, I appreciate your, your work in investigating the more of the, the backside of this. I think uh, in light of this, you know, we have been talking about this and adding the department to see who can and can't and working on teleconferences, Zoom, as, as Gary's learning the ups and downs of that right now as far as commission meetings. I think we're going to learn a lot from it. There's some advantages and some disadvantages. What I like so far about this proposal is that it's putting some structure into it of, of what we need to follow. And, and so we can later on, once everything's calmed down, if we do have certain type of situations, we can revisit it and look at, uh, is it going to work good for the county in different ways? And we, I think we can uh, rework it. And, and, but I think the structure is good. You know, I mean, uh, I read through it and there's a lot of detail. And I think that's what a lot of the people need to know if they're going to be at home wanting to do this. And the people that can't do it, they can look at it and say, this is some of the requirements. And it's, so I think the structure is good. And I, I think we're going to end up seeing more uh, stuff we're going to work on probably in the following year, if not later on this year. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I could. So thank you, Commissioner. Um, to Just for reference, I guess, this stack is all samples of other government entities that have these processes. Those were used to actually develop the one that was proposed for us. It's a basically templates very similar to the one that Commissioner Drew's got from our attorney in Sioux Falls. Um, so there's a combination, but they all did come from government entities. So that, that was used actually as a basis for the one that we proposed here today. So John, I had asked Gary and, and maybe if Jay could help um, when we bring some of this forward, maybe we could go through uh, you three as a team. Mm -hmm. So we're basically lawyering up. We have a, a Gary's actually in insurance sure. and then our HR. That way when we come back, we have, instead of you having to do all this, which is a lot of work, um, and it is your job in one sense, but it's nice to hear um, some other people's side, like the uh, insurance side, and then making sure that we're doing this legally that we kind of team up on some of this um, to figure out the best policy for Pennington County. So in the future, I'll have you work with uh, Gary and, and Jay, and then um, maybe we could figure out that, that best practices for um, Pennington County. But John, you've been doing a lot of work for us. We appreciate you a lot, you know that. Mm -hmm. um, you keep changing, or not you personally, but your job uh, description keeps changing every other day with trying to figure out policies and different things for us and then the next day you have to change or two days later or a week there's a whole new policy because this isn't going to work so you've been uh, working your tail off for us and we appreciate you John. Yeah, thank I'll, you Madam I'll Chair. Second that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I will say so again Commissioner Roskinek you mentioned this none of these are going to be written in a manner and I think that's going to be true for most of our policies this year. There's going to be changes. There's going to need to be changes to some of those just to pay. It's going to depend on how the, the current situation evolves. 
Um, so you're going to have this pretty much an ongoing process of review. Um, so I guess that would be my I ask for everyone in the county, employees alike, uh, to understand that while we might have something today, it could be different by Monday or Friday. Those things are going to continue to evolve. And then our role, too, is making sure we're communicating all that information out as quickly as we can. So. And I, and I think with Jay keeping track of some things on the side that comes in through, you know, um, liabilities in different areas and same with Gary, I think that's going to be helpful for you to keep ahead of the game instead of having you have to do it all. So. Um, that's going to be helpful at this time. You're, uh, I know, yeah. pretty much your generalist is working remote, and then you have you. So, um, a lot of different uh, HRs have more people helping them. So, um, I appreciate your work, John. Thank you. So, that'd be one of the discussions on if we have our meeting on Friday that we'll be um, discussing again. Number seven is the any other items uh, related to COVID 19. And first, we have Barry. Uh, Tice. Oh. <clears throat> we didn't want to go through the rest of these then, ma'am. No, we'll have him, then um, Sydney, then me, and then you again, oh, John. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Barry Tice, the Director of Health and Human Services, and uh, Chair Hadcock requested that I come up and give you a brief update on the economic assistance being provided through our office and um, some of the details included with that. So I'll keep my comments as brief as possible without the use of a PowerPoint. <laughs> Gary, um, can you hear Barry? Or does he need to be closer? Can you, Gary? Is, I, I cannot hear him. I can see him standing there, but I can't hear him. <laughs> Is this better? There you go. Okay. I can hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Um, HHS, like many other agencies, has been uh, working with a number of community partners as well as our partners out of San Antonio and Billings to uh, discuss the economic assistance piece, which impacts us as a county um, and many of our other counties. Um, HHS has always been the primary referral source for housing assistance in Pennington County, and so it seem logical for us to continue this process and kind of become the clearinghouse within our county um, for other nonprofits. And so I say that because what we've asked of these other agencies and we've come to an agreement with is when they receive a rent request, they send those calls to us first because I have the staff that are uh, what I would consider very high, highly trained in this and for the past few weeks, we've been getting staff shifted over to that in preparation for the increased call volume. And so we started this clearinghouse on Wednesday, and I refer to it as a clearinghouse, but it's easier for our community members, easier for our employees, and easier for the other nonprofit agencies. Um, and I'm pleased to report that so far it's going really well. And I say our Health and Human Services staff deserves a huge shout out on that because they're working remotely um, and it's working very well. Um, Barry, can you tell me the increase that on your workload because of the environment of what's happening around us and, you know, that sure. kind of thing? So people know that, um, and I don't think they do, that your increase is tenfold and that kind of thing. So. So I asked for a, we get reports daily from staff on uh, call volume and application volume. And I can tell you 85% of the calls this week are uh, regarding economic assistance, a majority of those being rental assistance. Um, there was a 53% increase in call volume as compared to last week. So as we know, and as I know you know, this will continue to uh, increase as the weeks and months go on. Um, a couple pieces to that too is we are focused on housing retention. The last thing we want to do is increase our homeless population. So the more people we can keep uh, or remaining in their homes, the better off we are as a, a community. And so, um, you know, we're fortunate that landlords have been uh, working with us because oftentimes landlords are not receiving an entire month's worth of rent because the 
um, the funding just isn't available like that. And so landlords have been really reasonable. And to this point, uh, we're very lucky. Um, we've received calls from other entities that have suggested that funding will be coming our direction here in the very near future. And so um, we'll see what that looks like. And of course, I'll keep you updated on that. Um, <clears throat> Another piece to this I wanted to point out is our veteran service office remains extremely busy and we're, uh, the, the veterans have actually commented that they appreciate the ability to do this from their homes versus coming into our office. So that's a process that works well. My last piece to this is thanking you, uh, the commission for moving forward with these different pieces on keeping our employees safe and allowing the opportunity for them to work remotely. This provides an opportunity for us to continue to serve the, the public, because if they're healthy, they can continue to do this. And so um, I wanted to thank you for that. And on behalf of the Health and Human Services staff, thank you for that, as well as our IT department, um, because they've been pivotal in making sure that this happens and keep our services running uh, and not interrupted. So with that, said. Questions? Thank you, Barry. Oh, thanks, Just, Barry. Um, I'd like to commend you and your staff, Barry, because um, at these times, I think, like you said, I, I think it's going to increase tenfold. Um, it already has for you and your departments. Um, our community, um, and I knew this before this happened, trusted you with health and human services of and uh, the economics of people that need help. Um, they are proving that but the, by calling you the nonprofits in the areas in our community that um, trust you, Barry, because you will know the answers and that you can help with the answers that they need or any other area in our community for people that are needing assistance at this time. So, um, Barry, your experience with this um, health and human services or humanitarian part of this COVID-19 and your um, employees um, is amazing. So we appreciate you a lot, and I think our community um, is showing how much you mean to uh, what what that assistance and what you do means to us. So thank you, Barry. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, next is the governor update. Uh, yesterday, me and Holly sat in a meeting with the governor and about half of the South Dakota counties. I think it was a very positive meeting and a very uplifting meeting for us. So the first information she gave us is there was 447 cases and Dustin, if I, if it's different, like you said, you, you, this was yesterday, there was 247 active, 146 recovered and 26 hospitalized. Our first COVID case in South Dakota was March, or March 10th. And today is April 10th, so it's about a month. Uh, there's 5,000 beds that we have and 1,300 ventilators well on their way is what she had said. Um, let's see. She has ordered the entire state, of course, to do the CDC guidelines and not more than 10 people in groups and social distancing. Lincoln County had a proclamation, 65 and older, to stay at home and also people that were vulnerable or have disabilities. So that proclamation was done, um, I think Dustin could tell, I think it was like two days ago, if I'm correct, correct Dustin. And then Minnehaha had, um, was where that was, um, where they had that, and Lincoln County, if I'm correct, Holly, that had that stay at home for the vulnerable and the 65 and older. At this time, they have more cases than anyone in, in uh, South Dakota. She also told us, which was very interesting, that she runs models, she does formulas, and she uses data to make her decisions. So when people are saying that she thinks the whole, or people are saying she should just make everybody stay home, well, when people asked her that, the bottom line is through models, formulas, and data, or what's called the R naught factor, and that R, R naught factor also is an antibiotic resistance spread kind of factor that they look at. Um, she's basing it on factual information. 
She's looking at how the virus spreads. She's looking at how fast it would spread, the demographics, the temperatures. Uh, the temperature makes a difference on this. So um, I commended her and I also said, when, when you do these models, formulas, or data, and, and, and the science of the virus, basically, could you relate that to our counties and our cities so we could back you up? So when we're saying something or we're not closing businesses down or we're keeping businesses open or we're doing different things or we're having to implement different processes in order to uh, follow basically your models, your formula and data, we'd like to be able to back that up with that information. And if you could send us, that's what I asked her, if you could send us some of that information, um, it's a lot easier to reiterate that to the public instead of guessing that we should close or that we should keep open or we should use CDC guidelines. Because a lot of people are, that I'm listening to are saying, well, the governor, you know, what's wrong with her? She has issues. She won't do this. She won't do that. Well, she also worked for the federal government. So she has connections and she is looking at data from um, Italy and, and different areas and different states. So she's, when I, when I announced the other day, I said, someone asked me about what I thought about the governor and what we're doing through the uh, Pennington County, basically of not calling it a emergency um, closure or to shut everything down. Basically, all I said is she's, she's stressed out just as much as any other leader. But I also believe that she's, she's not just guessing what she's doing. She's basing it on factual information just like the rest of us. She's not going to go with the fear factor. She's going to go with information like the rest of us through these formulas, through this data. And uh, it was nice to know. Bottom line is... Is she going to send us more information? Yes, she is. She also said she would meet with our counties once a week. So um, it makes a difference to do some communication with each other and make sure we're all on the same page and why and when and how we do things. So I appreciated that. The other issue is uh, the uh, closing the borders. So a lot of people have been seeing a lot of people come through the borders and go, oh, these people are coming here. Um, can you close the borders? And that was Dewey County that asked that. And she said, no, because we have a lot of people that work across the borders. Uh, a lot of the reservations go across the borders to get their food. A lot of people work um, like in Sioux Falls and different areas across the borders that wouldn't be able to come to their jobs. Uh, she said at this time, she would not be closing the borders. Lincoln County also asked the same question I did on, on how do you get your information and the data, the model, and the formula, and basing it on what's called the r not factor. Um, again, we appreciated her filling, in, fill us in, filling us in with that information. She also said you could go to the website, which is covidsouthdakota.gov, if you needed to learn more information and the things that she is doing. Um, she also said if we would have closed a sh and put a shelter in place um, too early, um, what happens is you probably would be closed almost until October. She said, if we sheltered in place, we would have to be closed until October. Let virus go through the state in a manner we can control better, which makes sense. Because if you close everything, um, there's two parts to a virus again. There's the COVID-19 part, and then there's the economic humanitarian part. So that made total sense. She wants to slow it down. Um, state parks um, are still closed. Uh, Custer, state, or Custer asked the question if, if they were going to close the parks, and she said no. She said, again, follow CDC guidelines. The state park roads will be open. Um, letter. So people were asking why she did not call it a public health emergency. She did not call it, actually, she took it to the legislators and they tried to address it with them and they shut it down. They would not uh, call it uh, a public health emergency. Um, she also said legislator did not support the action, public health emergencies. Um, was a rejected bill for the Secretary of Health also to have more authority. Um, the legislature also, legislature also rejected that. 
why you wouldn't call it a public health emergency, she said, is because some um, can, let's say, gives my secretary of health, uh, could be, if people were positive, she said, and uh, the secretary of health would also have and could have legal action against with the person coming back and saying, you know, you infected people. Um, um, basically, there would be lawsuits if you let, uh, it, call it a public health emergency and um, have the Secretary of Health um, call it that. I guess this is what, what I was trying to figure out what they were saying on that, but property taxes. Um, there will be no federal assistance on property taxes. Um, and she also said there will be, and, and I've heard differently since then, and it could change, there's not going to be any help with revenue loss for the government agencies at this at this time. And that's what she said yesterday. Um, Campbell County, again, was having overflow of tourists. People from Minnesota, they were um, fishing and coming to their, their areas. And again, she said people that work over the borders um, cannot close the state. They asked if the National Guard uh, could be at the polls for them because of the COVID-19 virus. And she said at this time, the National Guard is, is dispersed in different areas, but not for polling, polling areas. Next is uh, if anybody had any problems with polling or needed some help to call the Secretary of State uh, for their elections, maybe she could give some better answers. They also talked about the Hitterite um, mass that they have, Camel County that they are producing a thousand masks a day and that these are not N95 masks that are required. Um, but you can look on uh, the websites. Um, a lot of the Hitterite communities are producing masks. A lot of the counties had a lot to say. Um, it was pretty awesome. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, grocery stores. Um, someone said if, if you could do something with the grocery store. She said that's up to the employers. They should be recommending uh, CDC guidelines. She cannot go in and tell grocery stores, you know, you have to do anything and make your employees do anything but follow CDC guidelines. Essential and non-essential. Um, that is something I wrote. And then, let's see, Holly did... I miss, get, miss anything that we should talk about. Any questions? Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Commissioner Osconnect. I think what we're all looking for is that we know since March the 10th, these numbers have increased. And um, as Deb said yesterday, 447. I think what we're all looking for is where those numbers don't increase, where they stay the same and they start decreasing. So we're looking for the top of that bell curve. And so hopefully with all this uh, data keeping, we will finally know when we've reached the peak on this by looking at that bell curve uh, starting to do the drop. So she's thinking maybe May, June, sometime in that area for that peak, if... if that all depends on our behavior, yeah. on how we, how we uh, treat this and how we look out uh, for each other. Right. She also, again, um, bases it on the formula and the data from other areas, not just those big, huge areas. She's looking at across the United States. She has, she's has she been in touch with many of the other governors. She also has some federal uh, areas where she got help um, because she was federal before us. So, again, this isn't just something that um, she's guessing at this point. She's actually has an epidemiologist that's working with her. Um, so I think uh, at this time, she is keeping track of all of our counties. She's keeping track of all of our cities. And there's got to be somewhat of a trust factor when she doesn't give counties this emergency clause to just shut their towns down. Because, again, that could delay or when, when she, what she said, if I'm correct, Holly, that if you put everybody in their homes too quick and then you let them out, you're going to change what the um, virus does, meaning you could peak later. You could have other areas in that peak because of uh, shutting these towns or these cities down or these counties down too quick. So, Commissioner DeSanto. Madam Chair, um, 
Dustin, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can go to COVID19.gov and look up any state's COVID-19 cases, correct? So I would recommend that people that are doubting what Governor Noma is doing do that because um, South Dakota is experiencing one of the slowest spreads in the country. Um, one of, I'm not going to say it's the slowest spread, but one of the slowest spreads in the country. It's got just over a 1% mortality rate in South Dakota. Um, that's rates per case, so which is lower than I think almost any state in the country as far as their mor mortality rate per case. Um, that's people that are dying from COVID-19 um, when they get it. We've got a higher survivor rate, which is imp quite impressive. Um, we have to also keep in mind, and this is just an opinion, but it's an opinion formed by many other opinions that I'm reading and listening to, that keeping things open is going to lessen the impact on our citizens' mental health, it's going to reduce suicide, and it's going to lessen the numbers of relapses in connection with people that are recovered addicts. You stick someone away in home that's a recovered addict and stick them away at home and don't let them go to work and don't let them do the things that they normally do in their life, and they're going to return to those addictive behaviors that they had prior. Um, there's a much higher likelihood that that will happen. So uh, in my opinion, Governor Noem is saving lives right now. She is, uh, she's doing a fantastic job, and I wish that, that our citizens would um, support her and pray for her and, and uh, believe in her because, as Deb said, she's not just basing this on opinion. She's researching. She's in connection with many other experts um, on this subject, and she's doing a good job. So, and if you want proof of that, like I said, go to COVID19.gov and any state website, and you'll see that our numbers are much better than just about anywhere in the nation. So, thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Roskinen. Are these conversations with the governor, I assume they're recorded so that uh, folks want to listen, uh, there's a way they can go on there and listen? I thought some of those were being recorded. On the counties, no. They're just, we're just getting on a phone conference basically and listening and asking questions. I thought there was questions. a commissioner that recorded it. I saw an email that said if you want to listen to the conversation. Okay. I don't know that that was official. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. <clears throat> First of all, I think uh, the state, county, and cities, one of the biggest common goal they have is, is, has been to keep that curve low, and that has been the common goal from from day one. So, I mean, the, all three entities have that uh, goal in place. You know, one of the things I wanted to shout out, I think you guys made some good points on some with closures, not in closures, and so forth, but take a look at our community today compared to two weeks ago or a week ago. Some of the businesses that people were concerned about with how they were operating and doing things walk and doing good day. You know, they they're they're doing extensive cleaning. They're restricting the number of people there, and and not only that, but the citizens are also doing that. The more citizens are are being more aware, more cautious of how they're contacting people and so forth. So there is the change that's working in our community, and I think they're doing an outstanding job. With, we can sit back and argue about whether you should put an emergency clause in. People want to be told what to do and how to act well. It, it's your personal responsibility, and we're seeing that. People are being more cautious, and I think when we see some of those businesses doing those things, you know, we should be recognizing how well they're doing and thank them because without that service, uh, a lot of us would, wouldn't be able to do the work on our houses on our downtime and and, and do the lawn care and that other stuff that we needed to stay at home. So just, just when you're out and about, if you happen to see it, take notice of some of these changes and, and be appreciative of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Bottom line is, is again, we are leaders and we should support each other. And um, at this time, sometimes I'm seeing um, different areas where um, People aren't supporting their governor, or they're not supporting their mayors, or they're not supporting their their leaders. And again, um, I'll just tell you, most of us, including your emergency responders, your emergency management, um, they got this. 
Um, it's not always going to be um, favorable one way or another as we already figured out. But again, if you're basing it on models, formula and data and not a fear factor, and you're looking at both sides of, of the issue, again, there's two sides of this, um, then you actually um, know in a certain extent, so you're gonna guess on some of it, but most of the time, based on those models, based on that data, and I know uh, Dustin knows all about this, he's been doing this a long time, that it's somewhat of a guesstimate, but most of the time, um, I believe that they know. They know to a certain extent um, what's gonna happen next. And the governor's doing this in phases, which you should. If you're seeing a county like Minnehaha and Lincoln that have a, a bigger population that are having issues, she's actually looking at how many seniors were in Minnehaha and Lincoln County. She's looking at people and demographics of those people. And she's doing that in Rapid City. She's doing that in Beagle. She's doing that in different areas. And I, and when you listen to her at first, because you start listening to other people thinking, well, maybe the governor doesn't have this because they're saying, why doesn't she do this? And then why doesn't that mayor do this? Well, because if you're basing it on facts and information and something that's data, you're not letting a fear factor drive you um, into one desperation or the other. Meaning if, if you close too early, um, what's gonna happen? If you close too late, I don't think it's gonna be closed too late. Again, it's one in three that will have the virus and one out of a hundred at this time with data um, that will pass away from it. So think about that data and then put that into models, formulas and, and, and science of a virus that you don't know. And uh, again, um, I back the, I'll, I'll be up straight. I backed the governor up at the beginning because I had enough common sense to know if you have federal experience, if you have other governors that you're visiting with, and then you're basing it on facts and information, uh, you're doing it, you're, you're, you're damnedest to do the, the best job you can for South Dakota. And I'm, I'm again, I'm with Mark. I'm very proud of her. That's a lot of stress to deal with. <clears throat> and just as a citizen, it's a lot of stress. So you can imagine if you're dealing with what, uh, 900,000 people that you have to take care of, um, that's a lot of stress. So uh, I appreciate everything she's done for us, and I'm glad she'll be meeting us with us once a week. And uh, we'll see if we can record those, Holly, um, just so the commission um, at different times if they want to listen to it um, or other counties. So thank you. And this afternoon also we'll be meeting with Dustin. I think it's 2 o'clock um, with other cities in Pennington County. So we have resources that Penning, uh, the other areas in Pennington County for cities don't have. And uh, Barry's been, again, one of those, our fire service, uh, um, volunteer fire department, different areas in Pennington County that they need help with. Um, we are reaching out to them and making sure they're covered as well. So we have a great team here at Pennington County, our departments in different areas. Um, and I keep telling them they got this. We're way ahead of this game um, with these 17 departments. So we appreciate them again. Gary, do you have anything that I missed, sir? I do not, thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have um, Cindy has an update for um, elections. Good morning, Commissioner Cindy Muller, Pennington County Auditor. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody realizes that early voting starts next week on Friday. Um, the Secretary of State's office is getting ready to send out letters and absentee ballot applications to all registered voters in the state to hopefully encourage people to vote by mail. That is going to increase the amount of ballots that we have to process by mail in our office. And on a normal primary, I do bring in uh, at least two temps. So I know you guys have put the hiring freeze on and I am asking for you to allow me to bring in my normal two temp people that I hire. And I also want you to know that I am down one full-time person that I don't plan on replacing this year. So um, we're having other areas where people have temporary or um, seasonal. And I'll just be up straight. If they have people have that in that budget and they've cut that 10% and it was already in the budget, 
with the 10% cut, um, that's my opinion, if I'm correct, board, then they can still move forward. I think we have to, Madam Chair. Yes. I'm going to vote to approve those two temps. Okay. I think at this point, if she has it in her budget, we do not have to vote on it. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about the early voting? No questions okay. regarding exactly that, but as, uh, um, as Deb pointed out, these are temporary that are for a specific reason that's a short period of time. And I think that we can deal with that if it's in the budget and you've already cut your 10%. That um, right. as far as full time, keep on forever, um, right. that's where we're, we need to set our foot down. So. Right. Um, the other thing is, Cindy, is there anything on the elections or how you're going to let people in or anything like that if people come to vote? Do you have any updates on any of that for the We elections? are going to put out a press release that explains the process to vote by mail to encourage everybody to do that. And along with the other offices in this building that are letting people in by appointment only, that is what we're going to try to do for the in-person voting to begin with. We may have to adjust that. I'm hoping we don't have a lot of people that want to come into the building to vote. I hope that they are looking out for their safety as well as ours and will vote by mail. Thank you. Madam Chair. Cindy, <clears throat> Cindy, is there going to be an additional cost to be doing this by mail? I'm assuming. Absolutely. Quite a bit. Um, and with the city school election this year, I mean, my election costs are definitely going to be up. I'm going to look for as many places to cut as I possibly can, but there are just things this year that are beyond my control. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we're on county employees. Positions necessary to support county functions and then furlough options. Morning again, Commissioners. John Morrill, Pennington County Human Resources. So there's a few different pieces in the packet there for review today. Um, one of those is the implementation of a furlough option uh, with regard to our current employees. Uh, pieces that aren't included in the memo and or in the the templates, if you will, for notices to employees are some of the backstory, if you will. Uh, the decision to furlough is much like the decision to separate or to hire. There's other additional pieces that go along with that. So there would be information that would be shared with the departments that are going through that process with the employees that may be subject to that process. So again, understand that while this is very simple, just a, a one page memo, um, there's a number of things that have to go into training and preparing people for the furlough process. The template letters that you see here are simply that. Um, so again, the one that speaks to reduced work hours would have to be specially done for each furlough situation and a reduced hours. This one, for example, shows a four and a half day work week. That may or may not be what departments decide that they wanted to do. Um, so there has to be some customization to each one of these with each one of the employee situations by department. Uh, so again, it's not a one size fits all. And I, I think that was misunderstood initially uh, that these are the letters. Well, then that would mean that everybody that's going on a partial hours is working a four and a half day schedule. And we know that's not going to be the case. So we have some departments that are looking at reducing hours. We're having some that are looking to reduce overall uh, expenses for the department. So again, with the ask of us to reduce expenses over our budgets by 10% for the year, this is one of those tools available for departments to consider. Um, the benefit to the county as well as to the employee, because actually furlough is a per preferred option, um, the, the word scares people. Uh, when you hear furlough, it's like, they're cutting. Um, the thing with the furlough that's, that's different from a regular separation is that those people are still employees of the county. Um, so again, they still would be eligible for our health care plan. They'd still be eligible for South Dakota retirement system. All those pieces still exist for people that are on furlough. At the point you separate is when they lose access to those things. Uh, so again, the separation discussion is one that we have anytime we're out processing somebody. Uh, but we'd have a similar conversation with the employees that may be placed on furlough. The, the templates that you see here as well, the reduced hours and or the full referral, furlough, excuse me, 
are actually done in a manner that this provides the detail to the Department of Labor that they require to actually help people apply for unemployment benefits. So while you see these and they're very brief and very concise, there's very specific data points that are included there to help in that application process. So this is a template that worked on the requirements from the South Dakota Department of Labor, the federal government as well with regard to the CARES Act. Um, so again, I can have explained a little bit the, the process, if you will. So say, for example, a department decides that they want to reduce expenses or reduce a schedule. If you simply reduce hours for someone and don't give them a notice like this, it makes it more challenging for them to actually apply for unemployment benefits. By notifying them that there is a reduction, specifically outlining what the reduction is, then also tying it specifically to COVID-19, that opens up access to those unemployment benefits in, an, in a much easier manner, as well as to the CARES Act. And the CARES Act, again, is a federal program where not only would the employee be eligible potentially for the uh, state South Dakota unemployment benefits, the CARES Act actually provides up to an additional $600 a week all the way through the end of July for those people that are on um, unemployment as well due to this type of an action. So again, the, the furlough option is a tool. Um, it benefits the employee because it gives them easier access to unemployment. It also lets them know that while we're cutting hours or cutting the, the expenses right now, our intent is to bring you back. And, and that's the goal. So it minimizes the, the impact, if you will, to the employee knowing that their job is here. It does not promise that. I want to point that out. There's a thing in here saying that we'll do our best to bring people back into the positions they were or into an equivalent position uh, because you can't make that promise depending on what happens to our business model here at the county. Uh, but overall, the intent here to, to use the furlough is purely as an option to help the employees and to help the county uh, when we look at what those reductions need to be. I'll stand for questions. Madam Chair. Commissioner Gray. <clears throat> thank, thank you, John. And I think the key part about this right here and right now is that this is considered as an option. Something, and you may, I think you put it good as it's a tool in our toolbox to, for the department heads to take a look and, and see what's going on in their department and see how it's a tool that they can use one way or another, whether it's to actually help the department financially or to help an employee that you know, everybody in whole. So I, I, I guess that's what I want to stress at this point in time. This is paperwork and tools and guidelines to go by if it's chosen to go that way. Yes, sir. So it's not a recommendation of any employment action. And I would really be hesitant to, to make that recommendation. It's completely to the department's discretion as to how they're going to make those um, budget reductions work. This is just an option. And again, the, the benefit to the employees right now is because of the CARES Act and the, the fact that it provides an additional $600 for unemployment per week, um, there's the possibility that employees could be furloughed and actually make more while they're on furlough than they did while working full time for us. Yeah. Uh, so it, the break even is right around forty nine, fifty thousand dollars uh, in that area. If they're currently making about that much, they qualify for roughly four hundred fourteen dollars a week in um, unemployment benefits from the state, but an additional six hundred dollars potentially from the federal government. So it would be again over a thousand dollars they could make. Uh, on unemployment during the time that they're actually on furlough. Now, the, the negatives to that is that if they're on a full furlough, there's no additional deposits being made into their retirement account. Okay, so that's one of the drawbacks. They also would have to find a way to make their payments of their benefit portion because we would still continue to pay their benefits while they're on furlough. Um, so the employer portion, if you will, but the employee would need to make arrangements with the auditor's office to actually pay their part of those premiums as well. Uh, but overall, it's, it's one of those situations that's beneficial for the employee as well as for the county. Madam Chair, can I have a follow-up? <clears throat> sure. I've been great discussion on this in the last couple of weeks on how this works and and not only from people that feel that it's unfair for the amount and some would be making more and not working then working and so forth and I guess the way I look had to, to try to explain it is 
it's kind of a twofold thing and without knowing the intent of how it went is it's also an incentive that if if keeping your society safe it's safer to have them at home if you can do that mm -hmm. that's one way to explain it but it still creates some frustration in the community and it also creates some in the workforce some difficulty of people wanting to would rather be on this but i, I just want to stress that this is limited mm -hmm. limited time and one of the things that i read in the county one is you're still going to have to pay your part of the the health care system or our health benefits which is good because um we i looked at the health care fund we, we can't afford to pay do both Correct. i just looked at that yesterday and, and yeah it's not there to, to do it unlimited so i think it, it's an option but then and and be able to bring our employees back mm -hmm. and they got to keep remember if any of your departments do this you know when things we need you you have to come back and if you and if you turn us down you lose that other part I uh, explain that john yeah. a little more yes if i could madam chair so the the return to work piece of the furlough is important to note and there's a uh, an update actually to both of those notices that should be in the packet um didn't get it finished until yesterday afternoon so it may or may not be in the packets that you have but um, it does come down to that piece so once a person is furloughed there's the opportunity for them to be recalled at some point during the furlough period that was originally put on here the county does have the ability to recall that person as needed to come back to work or even at the end of the structured furlough um, we can say, okay, it's over, we expect you to be back to work. If the employee refuses in either one of those situations, not only would they lose their position with the county, they also would potentially lose the benefits from the state unemployment fund as well as the CARES Act. Uh, so again, this is a, a great tool and resource. Actually, it, it, it's strictly that. It's not a recommendation, it's just a tool. Uh, but there are some responsibilities on both sides from county as the employer as well as for the employee to make sure that there's clear understanding as to what this actually means. Uh, again, this looks very simple because it's just a couple of form letters and a, a single page memo. The process is much more detailed because you have to go through. So um, if this would be approved this week, Okay, and if it's not, that's fine. But there has to be a training process for the departments and offices here in the county as well as to what the next steps would be if this is approved as an option. Um, and then once we would get to the, uh, the furlough process with each individual employee, that would have to be a partnership again with those departments and with the HR offices to make sure that we can get everything lined out the way it should. They have all the resources and information. They know how to apply for loan employment, what benefits are still here, et cetera, et cetera, much as you would with any other out processing type of process. So, Madam so, Chair. Just one thing, Lloyd, um, that you might want to reiterate it's this is for non government agencies as well. Yes, I, I not just for true. I'm just saying yeah, we just went through this Monday. So right. with, with some employees. So I mean You're right. You need that information out there. Mm -hmm. We're getting questions in on You know, is it you have to do it once a week and follow up and there's still a lot of questions going through it That's why me and Deb had a talk earlier We need to you need to have the structure in place and the information Thank you. Um, Commissioner DeSand. Madam Chair, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, and I pointed this out a couple of weeks ago also when we were discussing this, but um, you know, a lot of people have a moral aversion to, to taking unemployment for some reason or another. Sure. Um, and, and some people, we, we're getting a lot of calls and a lot of people are concerned about the amount of tax dollars that we're spending uh, supporting <coughs> these employees. I just want to let employees know that unemployment benefits is an insurance benefit. It's not a tax benefit. Correct. You paid for it and your employer paid for it over the years. And therefore what you're doing is simply, it's just just like paying automobile insurance. You're, you're in a position now that you need this insurance to pay out to you. And, uh, and there's no, um, there shouldn't be any moral conflict to filing that claim the $600 that's going on top of that, the COVID-19 CARES Act part of it, um, that is tax dollars. But your unemployment benefits are not tax dollars. Those are premium dollars 
that have been building up in a fund, or should be, <laughs> for years and, and uh, should not, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, uh, cause a, a moral conflict with you that if, to take advantage of that at this point in time. And if Thank I'm you. correct, John, the points for unemployment right now are not used against us because of COVID-19. So with regard to the federal dollars, that's true. Um, I'm looking for clarification with regard to state dollars. Right. Um, the way it looks at this point, there still may be some implications with regard to our experience rating, if you will, regarded to this. Uh, the state program operas, operates differently, but I haven't received any data that specifies one way or the other on that. So my, my assumption at this point is that it would still potentially impact our experience rating, um, but they've not released any data on that. So for those that might not fully understand the unemployment process, it is truly an insurance program, so thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, but the, the entities, whether they be government or, or private, pay uh, what they call uh, it's a percentage based upon your experience rating, which is the number of claims you had and the dollars of those claims against your total payroll. So you, you pay a percentage on a monthly basis towards the unemployment fund, and that fund is where they try to have enough money to take care of claims. Now, as you might expect, different things happen. We look back at the big recession here back in 2008. Our unemployment fund in the state actually ran dry. They increased our rates as employers. Uh, I was a private employer at that point and had 20 some people working for me. Um, so you kind of gasp when you see the bill for short term, but they reduced that pretty quickly as soon as the fund built back up. Um, but Larry, it truly is an insurance program. Did you yeah. have something on that? No, no I, from my understanding, it is the points wouldn't hold against us for that, but you're absolutely right. When you have more claims and you have more than funding that you have, everybody's gonna pay more. That makes more sense. Yes, sir. And when you, when you use that, but as far as, uh, this is the understanding I got from other people that yeah, had yeah. their lawyers looking at it and stuff. It was, with this state case, they weren't gonna hold the points against them because of its, it's great uh, news. catastrophic event. Oh, you can it. verify that, John, some yeah, out through the state. that'd be helpful, next, but I, we I do, do this for a little That program. does make good point. We're, we're gonna have the highest point of uh, unemployment rate that we've had in many, many years, and, I, and it did drain dry one one year. So it'd be nice to find that out before we decide on the furlough options and see where bottom line where we're going with that. Gary, did you have information that you wanted to share on the furloughs? Can you hear me? Gary? Oh. Okay. John, and then positions necessary to support county functions. We have a basis to that John had pulled forward for us and also um, the people that are telecommunicating also a paper on that as well. And um, that's for more discussion, um, if we can do that uh, work session on um, Friday. But John, go ahead and, and explain that a little bit. You bet. So another one of the memos you have before you has to do with the Temporary Families First Coronavirus Response Act policy. Uh, we started looking at this about three weeks ago. Um, just shortly after it was signed into law on the 18th of March. And I think we had our first version for review that following Monday or Tuesday. Um, this is something that there's probably more urgency with regard to uh, approving uh, because it actually would include the approval of the application process for our employees as well. Um, know that whether or not we have a form, the employees are eligible to participate in both the emergency paid sick leave and the emergency family leave. The fact that we don't have a, a form right now complicates that for them, but does not mean that they're not eligible for those. Um, those things went into effect as live law as of April 1st. So this is probably the only one that's severely time sensitive in the packet, um, because without those, then it creates some um, challenges, if you will, as far as who's eligible to apply and what the process is for applying. Um, so you have there uh, the list of positions, uh, and according to the, the wording now in the law, I went back, so you'll see that that's not exempt, it's not essential, they're actually listed in the law as being excluded positions. Um, that list of excluded positions means that people in those positions aren't eligible to apply directly for these two benefits. Again, the emergency paid sick leave or the emergency family leave related to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So in bottom line, um, again, it's called emergency responder health care provider. So um, they have a list in your in your packet as well that, that tells people. Do we have that list? I'm sorry, we don't. Mm -mm. That will tell um, by department, by public works or uh, sheriff's department, um, basically emergency responders, different areas. And I think it, it deserves some discussion of what this board decides um, that each department needs. Um, John does have a list of people on that uh, uh, position necessary to support county functions, but I think we need to go through that and see if the board agrees or we they believe that departments need more or less. I think uh, that that should just be a list that we just you know decide today. I think it can be discussed a little bit more in how we're going to run. Um, our positions and again with furloughs in different areas I think once we see the budgets uh, that we had put forth to have the uh, departments um, with a 10% cut that might change a little bit so um, it is an urgency John but I also think it deserves more a little bit more discussion on when we see um, what the departments are discussing on their budgets as well so Madam Chair if I could we if nothing else, need to get the, the two forms put forward. Um, so the essential or the uh, excluded list, I understand. Uh, but the employees at this point need to know how to apply for these. Uh, and we don't have that because we're waiting for this approval. Okay. So if we could look at those two pieces of this, I would ask for those to be approved so we can get the information out there for employees. We have some people that are already out of work this week okay. because they understand these are available. Yeah, it's the same. same as this. Yeah, it's all the same. Hey, Gary, do you have any information on that that you'd like to share? I guess I'm not understanding the two forms that have to be done. So, Madam Chair, again, there there has to be a process for our employees to apply. The law already exists, uh, and we have people that are already out using this, but we don't have them on any documentation to show that they apply. And how many people do you have? I'm only sure of one at this point. Okay, so at this point, I think if we just have one, we, we can't still do it on Friday? Madam Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. You know, th these exempt, I, I, I looked through them. I think it's a good start of the list. I think what, the, the, what John's trying to get done is there's employees out there who, who, which covers over this is the daycares that got shut down. Uh, I know it talks about some of the COVID-19 quarantines and along with that other stuff, but it has a little bit more detail and stuff like that. I, depending on the board, I think it, I think the the excluding position list it could be a working document. Yes. In my in my building, I think we're going to end up looking over these at, probably on a weekly basis. Mm. Would be my guess as the departments move forward. So I, my thoughts is is I would I would feel comfortable uh, approving this today, knowing that that's a working document. It's not set in stone. If I could as far as the sure. excluded uh, well, I'd position hate, list. I'd hate to have people that, if this is the list for sure that we're doing and then we're going to add to it, it's a little bit different than if you're going to decide that, you know, um, some are not needed or some are, and then you tell them they're exempt and then they're non-exempt or essential is a good word or non-essential. Um, you're at this point everybody on this board is okay with these people exactly being essential if i could madam chair again as as commissioner lacroix mentioned it is a fluid list it would be a dynamic list and they may change based upon the needs of the county uh the operations that we have um, how we're functioning to support the the first responders and or the medical case providers those things will evolve as, as the, really the structure to what we're doing changes as well well I um, don't mind if it evolves John what I'm saying is if it's going to add more to it that's different than we agree to everyone on this list being um, essential so 
um, first I'm going to tell Joe he's essential. And then um, if I decide next week that he's non-essential and he's applied, we just, it's discounted. I mean, what I'm saying is you want for sure if this is, is this list that you want and if this board agrees. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. John, what you want today is just a, an approval on the form. On the forms if we could today, sir. Yeah, that would at least get us started with that process so the, the employees have the understanding of what this is. We, we can communicate the law, we can communicate the process to apply and then the review process within the departments. The list itself, um, that's less important to me, if you will, at this point. Um, again, we need to consider what that list includes. Those positions on the list are considered critical to maintain the infrastructure to help. We can, we can always modify who's yes, on the list, who's not on the list, and that form could, it's a moving target, it could change as well, but uh, you need a motion today so that we can at least get the process started. At least get the process started for the application process for the employees. I move Fair. to uh, approve the form. Second for discussion. Okay, move by Roskinex, second by um, DeSanto. So we're approving the request of emergency leave under the Family Medical Hair Leave Act and pursuant to the Families Crohn's Virus Act. Just the forms is all we're approving. Okay. I'll, just to make sure I can bring copies, may I approach? Yes. So, so the motion on the floor was to approve the documentation, but not to, not to, not the Pennington County excluded position list at this point in time. That's that's that correct, Ron? Correct. That's just the, just the form. Just the forms. The form. the form. so two the, forms. Yeah, two forms. So to get the process started. Okay, so there's three papers to the form instead of two. One is two pages. Uh, and then there's a single page. The other one is the notice that we had to post. So that was in the memo that that was included in the packet, and I don't think that ever got sent. Okay. I guess that's my frustration is now you have a different paper that we've never seen, John. And that was sent out last week, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, we, we have it. Because things are ever so changing, and it was last week, the only two papers I have are these papers, John. Mm -hmm. So now, last week you sent this, so it's a different form, and it's not in this page. No, the forms are the same, ma'am. The back page there in that packet. got a front and back on your... Am I yeah. on the wrong paper? Because these are the only two I... Is this the wrong paper I'm looking at? These were included with the packet. I just wanted to make sure that you had them. Family's so first corona... Act leave options, and then it has the two forms, and yeah. then it has the employee's rights. Yeah. Right. Okay, and I apologize, mine doesn't have what your guys's have, so that's why I was like, okay, okay, sorry, okay, sorry. Sorry, John, I didn't no, uh, see no the rest, and I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. so you're, I thought you were giving me something different no, than ma before. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair. Okay. John, could you could clarify for us that uh, when we approve the, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act leave options, um, if someone takes those options, mm -hmm. they're not also eligible for unemployment. That's correct. So while they're being paid by the county, they're not eligible. The only portion where they may be, okay, so there is one exception. If they're on the two-thirds pay for the extended leave to care for their, their child, so that's possibly they could apply for unemployment benefits at the point that they're on that leave. Now, it's if there's a reduction in their overall pay, they're eligible to always apply for the underemployment Pop or, or the, the piece, if you will, of unemployment benefits. So there is the potential. If they are on the first 80 hours mm -hmm. of pay, at full pay, they cannot qualify for that. And you'll notice there's very diff very distinct options with regard to who's eligible for each piece. So items one and three are for their personal health. 
Um, items four through six are for other conditions. And item five is specifically related to school closures and or daycare closures. Right. So there's different pieces that they're eligible for depending on which aspect of that law. Um, so I think at one of our prior meetings, we had a chart that gave that information. Mm -hmm. This is the actual document based on that chart. Okay. If you fall into this category, then you qualify for this benefit. Okay. Very is good. there anyone, any of the department heads that have any questions on this that want to come up and, and say anything on this or missing on either um, essential or non-essential or any questions to the board or John that they don't understand on the, the uh, request for emergency leave under the Family Medical Care Act, um, the forms or anything? Everybody understand them? All right. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, Gary, do you have any discussion? No uh, discussion. Okay, for this? Yeah. Okay, so maybe that's where I was missing. Okay, Gary, do you want to talk about the forms you got from Lisa? Is that for this particular area? Please repeat that, Madam Chair. Sorry, we're talking about um, approving the forms for the um, request for emergency leave under Family and Medical Leave Act pursuant to Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The forms you have to fill out. You said you had some other information from Lisa. All the forms that I received from Lisa, I did attach to that uh, whole document this morning. So is it different, Gary? I mean, what's what's the difference? I, I don't, I'm not sure there is any difference. That may be a pretty standard form. It's just a, a variation on the template, if I could, ma'am. So even the one that is in use in other counties now are based upon the one that we put together initially and sent out. Um, so even within Meade County, for example, um, that one is based upon our template that they altered to a, a version that they preferred. So um, these appear to have the same content. They, they have to with regard to the law. There's certain aspects that people are applying for or qualify for, uh, and there's certain data points that have to be provided to support those requests. So they have emer employee requests for expanding family and medical leave, and then they also have employee requests for emergency paid sick leave. Mm -hmm. So that's both these forms yes, together. Same that we you have. Just, you just combined them. I'm sorry. I'm not. No. I'm not following. I'm sorry. Family leave for coronavirus. So the lick, the sick leave and the um, emergency leave are the same. It's form. two components of the same law. They're not the same form. There's two separate forms there. Okay. Again, in the packet that I gave you just a minute ago. Okay. Yeah, there's two separate forms there. All right. Any other questions? Gary, you have any other questions? I really don't. I think I heard John say that they basically are just, just two uh, different versions of templates relative to this. Uh, if there's no real difference in them, uh, I, don't, I don't really have an opinion which one it should be. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, roll call, please. DeSanto? Aye. Drews? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Rosconnect? Aye. Hadcock? Aye. All right, so next we have suspension of performance pay. Oops. So um, as requested, here's some options with regard to reducing overall costs. Now there's a number of different areas that would be available for cost reductions. Um, these were two that were proposed based upon our current payroll and current pay processes for the rest of the year. Um, so what this document speaks to is the fact that there's potential savings to the county of reducing 
or eliminating the performance step option with regard to employees moving forward from this date. Um, it's, it's roughly three quarters of the employees, and again, I, I don't have the specific numbers on that. Uh, when we did a calculation on what that would mean to the county, it's a savings of about $354,000. Um, by reducing or eliminating the extra step. Now, what does that actually mean? What it means is that the employees for the rest of the year would get their single annual step. It also would mean that all the employees then over the course of this year would have received roughly 3.75 or 3.7% of an increase um, with the exception of the ones of the first two and a half or three months of the year that would have received that extra step, and then they'd be receiving about 4.9%, so about a percent and a quarter more for the ones in the first few months of the year, uh, and about 37 or so for the ones for the remainder of the year. Um, the performance uh, piece is the, the primary uh, option here being considered. Again, I can extrapolate and, and uh, estimate those expenses or the savings to be about 350000 to the county. The reclassifications and promotions as far as uh, making those changes and any applicable steps that would go with that, I don't have any way to estimate what the savings may be to the county of that option. Um, so again, it depends on the movement within departments, it depends on attrition, uh, it depends on a number of other factors that would be just basically speculation. Uh, but know that that would by not allowing the, the movements, if you will, would reduce the ability for the departments to promote or move to reclasses and give that person uh, an increase when they move plus additional seven steps or 15 steps uh, on the pay scale. So again, the, the goal there is to, to minimize potential future financial expenses for this year. Um, so that would be the, the two options to be considered. Again, they're simply cost-reducing measures as, as options. There, I think there's many other options that the departments have, uh, again, available to them uh, if we're looking to just truly just to reduce costs. I think there's other things that could be considered. Okay, uh, thank you, John. So um, do we have a motion for the suspension of performance pay? Madam Chair. Commissioner. Uh, John, this would just be temporary until we understand what the financial impact's gonna be to the county just as a, uh, one of our tools in our toolbox in case we uh, need the yes, sir. Uh, so, tighten things up a little bit? Yes, so the way it's drafted is actually that it would continue at the discretion of the commission. Again, you as a body have that, that right and power to determine any expenditures um, throughout the county. This would be in place through the end of this current pandemic and or through the end of this year. Uh, the way I believe it's drafted. I didn't bring my glasses, so I'm doing my best attempt at trying to stretch here and, and read what it says. Um, but I believe the way it's drafted, it says that it would continue through this the end of December this year, okay. but then we'd revert back to regular policies next year. Uh, but you would reserve the right then to continue this or to do what you'd want moving forward. Thank you. I thought it was more like till further notice, meaning no. that we actually said it to... Um, December 31st. Yeah. Madam Chair. <laughs> Commissioner Drews. I just want to address the part about uh, those that have already maybe received a uh, performance step uh, for the first three months of this year. Uh, not all of the employees that were uh, up for steps, I, I don't believe received that That's performance mm -hmm. uh, increase. That's up to a recommendation from that department head. Um, I would uh, I would not favor going back and trying to remove that uh, performance step from those that have received it, no. understanding that moving forward that that performance step is not going to be offered for the near future. Thank you. Yep. Madam Chair. Thank you, Gary. Oh, Commissioner uh, LaCroix. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, yes, the document in front of us has has a date on it because I think we, when we were discussions, we were talking about re, it would be reviewed at the end of the year and then the year's 31st or close to the end. My only question is, is you know, as things change, John and, and the commission, we don't know what, what could happen. We, I mean, we really don't. We're preparing for the worst. And some things could change drastically in any given department and we may have to have uh, one employee who's end up doing three jobs. I don't know. I've, I've seen it 
several different ways when, when, when you get into reduction of workforce, how things change. In the, if that becomes the case, and we're saying no more reclassifications and promotions, you know, there may be a time when we have to, and that's gonna be something that's gonna be brought to the commission. It's not a, a, an open decision, so right. if something happens in a the department and they feel that they need to do this, because it's the only right thing to do, they're gonna bring it to us, correct? Yes, sir. So okay. that, those decisions, anything with regard to pay or process, always will default to the commission for that decision. Okay. I, I would ask that that actually be openly offered. Uh, so the way this is drafted, it just says we're stopping this process. But I, I think having that understanding that if there's a need, um, again, promotions and training. I think one of our departments spoke about that this last week, or even earlier this week, um, about they have a continual need to train in advance and move people through uh, in order to develop their skills so they're better able to do, perform the services that they need to for the county. I think in those situations, we would want to invite them in to visit with the commission uh, to talk about those specific people. Yeah. The performance pay, um, Let's vote on that first. Um, is there a motion to that effect? I would make that motion. Motion by DeSanto. There's a second? Second. Second by Ross Connect. Any other discussion? Roll call. Uh, Madam Chair, could I have the motion repeated? Second. Effective April 10th, 2020, I move to suspend all performance step pay increases for the remainder of 2020 with a board review to be completed prior to 2021 to evaluate the need to continue the suspension into 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Roll call. DeSanto. Aye. Drews. Aye. LaCroix. Aye. Ross Connect. Aye. Hancock. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, suspension of reclassification and promotions. Do we have a motion? What is the motion that we have in your paper? Madam Chair, I believe we Mr. need to DeSanto. add to this as per John's recommendation. We can do an amendment. Um, well, we haven't made the motion yet, so we don't need to amend it. Okay. <laughs> but we do need the, the language that I would need to put on there that would permit us I think it would be something as simple as the board invites departments to to discuss their needs in executive session. Um, if cases exist that would require uh, exceptions. How about upon board approval, exceptions may be there you go. made. That's much better. Okay, so read the full thing when she, once you get done writing, Commissioner DeSanto for us. What needs to be considered when you do that is you've got a 10% cut. So um, are you going to have people added to their budget to do promotions? And no. You see what I'm saying? So they'll have to keep it within their budget if they're doing these promotions or uh, reclassifications. Correct. And that's something we'll consider when they bring it before the board. Yes. Yeah. Just yeah. so that people know that, that you, know, you can't get a 10% cut and then do reclassifications in the in the next year and then pull your budget back up i mean hopefully that's common sense but just saying it okay motion so i would move to uh approve effective april 10th 2020 i move to suspend all reclassifications and promotions for the remainder of 2020 with a board review to be completed prior to 2021 to evaluate the need to continue the suspension into 2021. Upon board approval, exceptions may be made. So motion made by DeSanto. Do we have a second, please? Second. Second by LaCroix. Any more discussion? Commissioner Drews, you have any discussion? No, uh, it's a good motion, I think. Okay, let's do roll call then, please. DeSanto? Aye. Drews? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Ross Connect? Aye. Hadcock? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, John. Yes, I think that's it. Thank you. Next, we'll have County Operations Update. Ms. Hawley, I know we have some changes up front. Um, 
when we come into the county facility. So anything else besides that that we have, Ms. Holly? Uh, no, not that I am aware of. Um, operations continue to run smoothly. All the services are still being provided. Um, there is discussion of some changes to the administration desk up front. Um, the appointments are not coming in quite like we anticipated, so we are discussing removing the clerk that is up there that will be checking people in, and Sheriff's Office feels that the deputy can do the screening and take care of the individuals. The only adjustment that we'll probably make to that is next week when we start equalization hearings. Um, appointments are every 15 minutes, so we will have a significantly larger number of people coming in that um, will probably be a lot for one person to check in. So um, at this point, I believe we're moving forward with removing the admin person from upstairs, and the deputy will handle the majority of it. And he can do the screening and things Correct. like that. Correct. He continues to do the screenings. And how about elections? Did we have anything different, or are we just... I am not aware of any, but that's okay. Cindy's. Okay, just to make sure if she needs someone up front that we, we have that covered as well. Yeah, she stated sure. earlier that she was going to try it by appointment to start. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll make the adjustments as needed. Madam okay. Chair. Commissioner Drews. A question for Holly. I, I, I missed the part where you said that you were, were talking about removing something. I didn't hear what that was. Gary, we're talking about removing the clerk that we have that sits up front at the desk at the admin building. There just isn't enough people coming in from outside to keep them busy. So okay. we think Thank the deputy you. can do it all. Thank you for keeping track of that, Miss Holly. Yes. Next is the 2020 10% budget reduction, including non mandated programs. Do we have discussion? Do we have a motion? We had asked last week um, if the department heads could do a 10% reduction and we did not make a motion, if I'm correct, to that effect. So we do need that motion. And then on Friday, um, discussion on some of that uh, with a work session and um, figure out where we're going from there. I would make a motion to um, request each department to reduce their budget by 10%. So it would be a 2020 10% budget reduction, including mandated programs. That would be my motion. There. Second. Motion by DeSanto, second by Rosconnect. Discussion? Can you repeat the motion again, please? It would be the 2020 10% re budget reductions, including non-mandated non-mandated programs. Did you hear that, Gary? Uh, I heard that. I didn't hear a percentage put on it. 10%. 10%. Gary, did you hear 10%? I'm sorry, Gary, what'd you say? Uh, if you have a motion in a second, I'd like to have a little discussion. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, I just uh, recognize that 10% may be difficult for every department. Some may be able to exceed that. Some may be not be able to reach it. So um, I would like to see a little bit of leeway provided there. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner LaCroix. I, I agree with Mr. Uh, Drew's. You know, you know, I understand the straight cut across 10%, but I also, I'm, I'm under the understanding we're going to have some more discussions throughout this week and be able to clarify some of that because some of, some of this reduction, if we cut, we could lose revenue. And I think we've got to kind of weigh out which which parts are. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm willing to listen, but I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Gary, and I think that's why... We need to look at and have that work session to figure out where we're going because um, some, like you said, some have revenues, some do not. But bottom line is with Cindy, um, if it has to be 10%, it has to be 10%. So um, I'm willing to look at that as well. But um, depending on departments, like some only have two in their departments, and I understand some of that too. So again, um, I think 
when we do this, we are making the motion, but we're going to have to go back again and look at some of those areas that have revenues and stuff. But again, 10% um, might just be the beginning of this as well. So um, we need to keep that in mind as well. Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. Get Let me go first. Okay. Uh, I think that what we should focus on is if if a if a if a department can't cut ten percent because of specifically loss of revenue or something having to do with the cost to their department because of COVID nineteen is where our ex exceptions should be made. Is right. my opinion. And I guess when we see those budgets, we'll be able to tell that. So. We'll have that discussion then. Commissioner Drews. Uh, I would like to just offer an amendment to that motion of simply adding some words in there that uh, each department strive uh, for 10%. There you go. So um, thank you, Gary, but I'll, I'll say again. So when we strive for 10% and then we need maybe another five um, later, are we going to say we're going to strive for 10, 5% the next time? Now, I, under, I understand that we may need to do something uh, further down the road, but um, to try to try to say to each department right now that they have to uh, uh, eliminate 10%, I think we have to do it on an individual basis to a certain extent. I just don't think everybody can reach that. See, and, and, and I do appreciate that. I guess for me, again, um, I wouldn't put the amendment in there. I'd look at the budgets first, and then if we have to come back and... Um, make some discussion, meaning have some discussion on certain areas of revenue and exceptions, that's when we should do that based on um, when Cindy brings us those numbers that these reductions already have. Um, that's my opinion. Board? I'm Madam sorry. Chair, or... Just a minute, Mr. Go Richard. Ahead, Commissioner. I I just think back when we've done some reductions earlier, and <clears throat> I like the wording that Gary's using for the simple fact that then there's some issues that, you know, they're going to strive to do it, and then we're going to ask them why they can't, and then we can justify whether that is or not. If we want to, I've seen in the past where we, we've made those, made them make those cuts, and then there was some of the consequences that followed with it that, you know, we understood, but I think the striving, I think every department is made up different and we do the best that we can. And if it's, once we review that, if it still doesn't seem good enough and we looked at what they would, might have to do more, that would be a decision we have to make at that time. So okay. um, that, that's just my thoughts. Mr. Witcher. Thank you, Eric Witcher, Director of Public Defender's Office. I would just ask for a clarification. Are you re asking us to submit a budget reflecting the 10% as opposed to cutting our budgets by 10% and doing the actions necessary to make that happen effective essentially immediately? I can, ad I can advise the commission that that would require me to either furlough necessary staff or terminate staff effective immediately if that was what the board is asking, is it, was that clear? Yeah. Right, That's so clear. are we striving or are we just telling them 10%? Because again, um, I would see what those 10% 10 per, 10 cuts were and then look at them instead of putting striving to, put the, to do that right now because I guess I wanna see where they have to cut if it's 10%. And then we decide, are we saying uh, we should strive for that? And then, and then you're putting it out there that Joe might strive for that, but he believes essentially that this is good. And, and Janet might strive for that, but she, she, she essentially does this. What I'm saying is make the motion, have them look where the cuts would be, and see if it's essential and non-essential to their operations. So, Madam Chair, just Commissioner clarification Lefray. on my point. This is not a, for this motion for two days to give the directive to have them do the 10%, which they probably knew about a week ago, 
this may happen, right? Am I right. correct? This is not, they bring it to us what those at 10%, what that would, what how that's going to affect you. Right. And at that point in time, when we see all that, then we make a decision where it, it could go by department very well. Could be. I mean, we're going to have to look through this at, well, for and, the commission. I, I mean, but for the, for this motion, that's what you're asking is to give the directive a 10%. Right. They come back to us and we see what those cuts could be. And yes. at that point in time, we can make the decision whether we could uh, defer from that or do right. something else. Okay. Madam so Chair. Does that help? They have, that what, what's happening is, is we told them Monday. So by next week, which gives them two weeks to figure out if they can make that budget. And if they can't make that budget, what they'd have to have to do to make that budget, then you can look and say, okay, um, based on this, they're essential uh, operations in order to make cuts or whatever is is going to reduce the revenues. That's not going to work. Then you got to figure out the numbers based on what Cindy's saying that we're going to need in order to have these operations and make some serious decisions at that point of where that money comes from. So once you see budgets, once you see where revenues are coming from, then you would decide on that 10% cut, basically, because Eric's saying, I can't run an operation or I have to let people go. There might be revenues or different areas that we're missing. So first, let them decide again. And as Gary says, strive for the 10%. But if you say strive, um, maybe it when we see Erickson, he has to cut four people in order to get his 10%. That might be different. But... For me, I need, this is me personally, I need to know where those cuts were going to be or why they can't make it. And they should have those in by next Thursday, Holly? Yes. And um, then the working session would be on Friday if, if we agreed at 9 a.m. to look at all these situations and then go, okay, what are we basing this on and more discussion. So, Madam Chair. Make sense? Commissioner DeSanto. I believe that that can be accomplished with or without the amendment, so I don't have anything against the amendment. It can be accomplished either way. So okay. we have an amendment and a second to that amendment. Lloyd, you seconded it, correct? Sure. You did? I, I thought you did. <laughs> <laughs> for, for discussion. Um, but uh, Who made the motion, Ms. Gary? Gary made the motion, the amended motion. Yeah, okay. Gary made the motion? He made the amendment, yeah. He made the amendment to my motion. Has that been to, seconded? To add strive. Okay, so Kara, tell me. There was a first by DeSanto, a second by Ross Connect to, for the original one. Okay. And Correct. then Gary made the friendly amendment. And you accepted the I friendly I accept the amendment. Okay, so the motion was made by DeSanto, second by Ross Connect for the friendly amendment. All right. For the motion. The yes. Original motion. With the amendment. Yes. And you're both in agreement, right? So the amendment is to strive. Correct. Okay. Because my reasoning behind that is that we can accomplish the same right. thing next Friday, regardless of what that motion says. Okay. Madam Chair. Okay. Madam Chair. We're clear on this, right? Okay. Okay. You know, we're not just, just food for thought. You know, when me, me and Ross connect were in a meeting, I remember Ron asking one of the highway people, give me two options. You know, so I, I would tell these departments that that 10 percent, you know what that's going to affect. Eric, you said I'm going to have to eliminate these people. But what could be done is a second option. But I mean, just a food for thought. I mean, that 10 percent could be detrimental. Maybe not. That's for us to decide. But I would have a backup plan if I was you guys. Okay. Sometimes um, if you wish wash on things and you, and you, and you do stuff, it, it's confusing to me, let alone, I don't know if it is to the department heads, but it is to me too. So um, I would like to direct, if, if I was a department head at 10%, I would have to see where my cuts are and then come back. And then um, once we discuss it again, but if you want to strive in there, that's fine. Um, Sir. Madam Chair, Mark Fargo, Penn County State's Attorney. I was just going to offer perhaps a, a flip side of that. 
I understand the, the point of direction, and I think when we're told to strive for 10%, that that gives us pretty clear direction. I think the difficulty being when you said an absolute, give us a 10% budget, that locks numbers into people psychologically. And until we've seen the data, uh, the chair spoke fairly eloquently this morning and passionately about not fear mongering and really waiting to see what the data told us on behalf of the governor. I'm urging this commission to do the same thing as it relates to our own budget. So I would appreciate the friendly amendment that Commissioner Drew's offered and uh, we will certainly submit everything we can. I think your department has your taking this very seriously. Uh, you can look at some of the things they've already done right. uh, without mandates from the commission. And so, uh, like I said, I would appreciate Madam it as Chair. amended. Commissioner DeSanto. Just Madam Chair. Hold on just a sec, Gary. Speaking to what Mark just said, one unfortunate part of this whole situation is, Mark, we're not gonna know probably until October or maybe even November what it, what this is gonna look like in, in our budget, in the whole county budget as far as revenues are concerned. Um, I don't think that the, that the backlash of this whole thing is really gonna show up until that point in time. So that's, that's why it makes it difficult for us to give you a specific number, but, um, but I, I appreciate what you just said that, you know, giving them some leeway, let the departments look at what they're doing and, and uh, see what we can do. And I, they are taking it seriously. We've made it pretty clear that we want 10%. So. Commissioner Drews. I want to go back to, I didn't actually hear everything that uh, Mark Vargo had to say, but I'll go back to and use Eric as the example for what he said. Uh, and I think that what we're looking for, uh, and, and as I look at the various departments and where they have to cut, a lot of them do get to the point of where they're probably cutting personnel or reducing uh, personnel in order to get to that 10%. So for instance, like with the public defender's office, I think if Eric can bring to us, and this is my opinion, if Eric can bring to us showing what he can cut and maybe that's only 6% or 7%, and then show us that if he was gonna go to 10%, what he was gonna to have to do to do that, if that's mm -hmm. reducing personnel or whatever, so that we have that information in front of us and can actually make a determination uh, at that point in time, uh, what is absolutely necessary to, to do. Understanding that a week later or two weeks later, this whole situation may change again and we may be coming back to department saying uh, we don't have the revenue coming in we're, we're going to have to make more cuts so uh, that's just my opinion on that thank you thank you Gary I guess that's where I was going have them do the 10 percent and they would have showed anyway where those cuts would be and then we could decide the same way and that's exactly what I said actually was um, you're going to have to do 10 percent cuts okay let's say Holly Holly has to do 10% cuts. This is what she'd have, this is all she can cut, but if she does 10% cuts, this is where she's getting it from. And it's, she's gonna have to say, well, I have to cut this. That's, that's exactly what I was saying, is have them do the 10% cuts, and it would show in their budgets, because you, you know, when, you, when you're saying you're doing a 10% cut, you're gonna show already where you have to cut. Am I correct? Out of your old, overall budget, whether it's operations or anything else. Just looking at Holly's, she has a little bit of everything. So um, bottom line is, I guess that's what the motion was in the first place, but. I guess um, my, I misunderstood that. <laughs> and maybe everybody else did, but that that's where I was going, is bottom line, you're gonna change and we're still at the same place. If you have everybody do the 10% cuts, we're gonna see revenues, that's what I was saying. We're areas where um, we're going to be guesstimating some revenues, and, and the sheriff's department, he's not going to be guesstimating. He's going to know if he has uh, 10 more um, federal prisoners, you know his revenue is coming in no matter what. So that's what I was trying to say is you'll see the 10% cut. And what's the goal we're going for? What's the amount, if it's $5 million, if that's where we're going, then how are we getting there? And if he's just added a million more in revenue, then that's a little bit different than us reducing, saying we got to reduce five million, but we know the sheriff is bringing in an extra million. Does that make sense? So when you do the 10% cuts, you're taking all of that in. So you can add strive, but it's the same, it's the same motion. Madam, Madam I call for question. Okay. 
Go ahead. And Sorry. I think a, one more. You uh, have to vote on calling the question. Okay. Question's been called. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Thank you. Mark or Mr. Witcher, you can speak and then we'll go ahead and move forward. And you know, I, I think I know exactly what you're asking for. It's sort of what I did. I can tell you it's, you know, I, I can save 180,000, which is 6.4% of my budget. Yes. And then it gets, you know, substantially more painful every percentage. And so I'll, I'll provide all of that information to the commission. So thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go ahead and do roll call. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I got your point. Are we doing the motion with the word strong? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So DeSanto? Aye. Drews? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Ross Connect? Aye. Hadcock? No. Motion carries with one no. Okay. Um, next is 2020 revenues. Um, what are we talking about on that, Holly? I think it's just to remind the departments to estimate those as well if they foresee any losses um, and submit that with their budget reductions next week. Okay, so basically what we just talked about. And my intent is I'll send an email out to the department heads this afternoon with some clarification on exactly what we want submitted okay. um, and to include the detail and the revenue section as well. So Okay, so what did we put on there when you sent the first memo, Holly? Was it to... I remember putting grant FTEs and some other stuff in there. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the board knows any other details that I'm missing that you. Just budgets, revenues, employees, grant supported. Temporary, um, anything like that, seasonal or employees. Okay. Thank you, Holly. Okay. Motion to adjourn. We have uh, future board of commissioner special meeting dates first, sir. Oh. So um, on Friday, we'd like a work session at 9 and then the Board of Commissioner meeting at 1 if that works for our board. Anybody opposed to that? Gary, did you hear that? I did. Thank you. Okay. So do we have to make a motion? Okay. Do we have a motion for a 9 o'clock work session and a 1 o'clock Board of Commissioner meeting next Friday the 17th? That would be my motion. Motion by DeSanto. Second. Second by Drews. Or Drews. Ross Connect. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Oh, wait a minute. We got oh, a roll, roll call. call. <laughs> Sorry. Santo. I was aye. looking at this at the same Drews. Time. Aye. LaCroix. Aye. Ross Connect. Aye. Hadcock. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. DeSanto. Adjourn. I can move to adjourn. Second by LaCroix. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Oh. Roll, roll call. call. <laughs> roll call. <laughs> DeSanto? Aye. Drews? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Ross Aye. Connect? Thank you all. Aye.